Looking at electronic structure, um, the reason why we're going to talk about this is it turns out that in chemistry, the properties of elements, um, the compounds they form, and the properties of those compounds can largely be explained by interactions that are involving the electrons. Really, the electrons are the key pieces in chemistry that explain what are the properties of different compounds and different elements. And um, how those electrons interact um, that results in these properties typically involves two things. It involves both the number of electrons and protons, so how many electrons there are, how many protons there are, and then how, what the forces between those are. That's important. And the second thing that's important is the location and the arrangement of those electrons and atoms. Um, as we change where those electrons are and how many electrons are in which location, and as we change the location, the arrangement of those electrons, how they are compared with each other, that changes the properties of the substance. And so really is that we really need to figure out about how this electronic structure works in order to be able to predict properties, in order to be able to predict how atoms will react together to form compounds, and then how compounds will, um, will interact with each other. The term that's used for this particular arrangement of electrons is called the electronic structure, which is the, the, key p, the key name of what we're looking at in the standard here. And so the more we understand about an atom's electronic structure, uh, the more we can understand about the properties it's going to have. So uh, looking at this historically, um, the initial evidence that let scientists determine how the electrons are arranged in atoms involved interactions between electrons and electromagnetic radiation. So we have the electrons in the atoms, we have electromagnetic radiation that's in the environment around it, and they interact together. And how those interacted let us figure out, you know, where are these electrons and how are they structured. So let's look a little bit at electromagnetic radiation. We're going to abbreviate it here, EMR, just because it's a fairly long word here, but our term here. But electromagnetic radiation is a type of wave in the electric and magnetic fields. It's caused by accelerating charges. Anytime you have a positive or a negative charge that starts accelerating, most commonly caused by them vibrating back and forth as they sort of move back and forth like this, um, that'll result in a wave in the electric field and a wave in the magnetic field. And those two waves combined are electromagnetic radiation. So some things are important to know about electromagnetic radiation. One is it carries energy through space. So all waves carry energy through space, but electromagnetic radiation is particularly important here uh, because of the fact that it's emitted by charged particles, sort of like we talked about up here, and it can be absorbed by charged particles. So if I have an atom that has electrons and it gets hit by one of these electromagnetic waves, it can oftentimes can absorb the electromagnetic wave. The energy transfers from radiant energy, the energy carried by electromagnetic waves, into some other form of energy, um, most commonly um, electric potential energy or chemical energy. Um, so electromagnetic radiation can be in a variety of forms. Uh, X-rays would be one, infrared, radio, uh, microwaves, uh, ultraviolet, um, gamma rays. The most familiar form though to most people is visible light. You know, the light that you can see with your eyes. Uh, you know, the colors from red all the way up. Roy G. Biv from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, the old rainbow colors right there. So that's an example of electromagnetic radiation. Let's look at its properties. Like all waves, electromagnetic waves have a speed, a frequency, and a wavelength. So I have an illustration here of three different waves. All of these waves, we're going to assume, you know, just for purposes of looking at this, are traveling off to the right. And so they're traveling off to the right at some speed. We'll call it V for velocity right here. But that's going to be the speed that they're traveling at. Um, and so these should actually be moving in this direction as we see it. Obviously, we can't because it's just a picture. But let's assume these waves are moving here. And let's assume that you know this illustration that we have right here, you can see there's some blue lines. So it has, says one second in between them. So we're imagining that basically that every second is that what you're seeing in this picture is what passes by. And so that wave goes by in a second, or this goes by every second for that lower wave down there. But that's basically what this picture is trying to illustrate here. Um, so all waves have this uh, speed, frequency, and wavelength. So the first one is the speed, how fast the wave is going. So uh, the way we figure that out is the same way we figure out any speed. So it's basically equal to distance divided by time. If you know the distance the wave travels and you know the time it took to travel that distance, take the distance divided by time. That'll give you the speed of the wave. Um, so that's our first thing. That's basically just how fast it moves. Uh, we'll call it, as we said, V for velocity. Um, the units we're going to use here for all equations involving electromagnetic radiation are meters per second. If you have a wave that you know the speed, or electromagnetic wave, you know the speed, and it's not meters per second, you're going to have to convert it first before you use any of the equations we'll see in this, uh, in this section. Second one is frequency. 
Frequency is simply how frequent the wave is. So it's the number of waves per second. Um, so in this case, we have our three pictures here, our three different waves. For the first one, we're getting basically one wave every second. The way we know it's going to be one wave is you look at, say, the beginning, and I'll sort of draw a little dot here at the beginning of the one second. We're at the trough on the wave. The trough is the bottom portion the very lowest spot on the wave. So we start at the trough, and then where do we end? We end also at the trough. Are there any troughs in between? No. So that's been one full wave that's gone by, or one wave length, as we'll see in a second. And so since one wave has gone by for this top wave in one second, we would say it has a frequency of one hertz. So a capital H, lowercase z is the symbol. It's spelled like the rental car company, but Heinrich Hertz, if I remember correctly. So Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z. Um, but the abbreviation is capital H, lowercase z, and so it'll be one hertz. For the next wave that you see below that, uh, it has a frequency of one and a half hertz. The reason why is let's look at how far it goes. So the wave starts at this point right here. Uh, the next place where that wave starts repeating, one wavelength, is going to be to right that point. But then we don't get another full wavelength. The next one is we only get another half a wavelength. So this means that for our second wave, that this has a frequency of one and a half hertz because there are one and a half waves go by every second. Notice that we're not just counting peaks. We can't just say, oh, that's one peak, that's two peaks right there, th and so it's two hertz. That's not the way it works. Is that what we've got to do is we've got to look at where the wave started, in this case sort of just inside, just past the trough, and then look at how many times we get back to that same point. For this wave, we wouldn't get all the way to that point again until somewhere over here, and that's not within the one second. Um, but overall, what we want to do here is you basically look at the number of waves per second. So for our last one, our third wave, let's look at how many waves go by there. So we start off at this point. It repeats itself here. It repeats itself again here. And let's see. Make sure I'm getting my spots right here. Repeats itself here. So it says that's 3 hertz, but really that's probably closer to about 3.5 hertz, the way they've drawn it out here. So really that should be 3.5 uh, because of the fact that there have been 3.5 waves that have gone by in a second, the way, we've, the way we've drawn it out here. So frequency is number of waves per second. The last one is one we've sort of already seen here. It's the, it's the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between a wave's consecutive crests. And so the crest is the top portion of the wave right here. And so if we measure the distance from crest to crest right here, that distance is going to be the wavelength. So you can see our top wave has a pretty big wavelength. The next wave down uh, has a much smaller wavelength. It only goes from here to here, and so a little bit less distance there. And then our very last wave has an even shorter wavelength. Notice that you don't have to necessarily do crest to crest. You could do trough to trough. Or you could do, just like we saw on this previous one, at some arbitrary point to where the wave hits that same arbitrary point again. Um, it's usually easiest, though, to do crest to crest or trough to trough. But that's wavelength. Symbol-wise, we said that velocity is v, or speed is v. Frequency is going to be lowercase f. We said that's in hertz. Wavelength has a little bit weirder one. Um, it uses the Greek letter lambda. It's lowercase lambda. It's their letter L. Uh, it basically sort of looks like a, somewhat like a lowercase y that's been mirrored like this. Um, and so it's wavelength, so it's length, and so it uses the Greek letter L because for length. That's the reasoning behind it. But the units we want to use in that are meters. So once again, is if you know a wavelength that's not in meters, you want to convert it to meters before you use it in any formulas. All right. So uh, speed on this. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light in empty space, but somewhat slower through matter. So the speed of light is uh, in a vacuum. So when we say empty space, uh, basically we mean it's not going through anything. This is something that makes uh, electromagnetic radiation somewhat unique for as far as waves go. Every other type of wave in the universe has to go through something, some type of matter. Uh, so water waves obviously have to go through water. Um, whenever sound waves, they have to go through matter. You need air or you need uh, some other solid substance or liquid substance for the sound to go through. Uh, sound doesn't travel through empty space. Water waves can't go through empty space. Uh, but light and other types of EM radiation can. Um, and so when it does travel through empty space, it always goes at this speed right here, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that's rounded uh, to basically the nearest 300, that's the nearest 100 million uh, right there. Um, but that's going to be our speed of light in a vacuum. If it's going through matter, however, EM radiation goes a little bit slower. Uh, for example, in air, it goes about a little uh, between 99 and 100% of that 3 times 10 to the 8th. So you'd expect it to be between 200 and 
95 million and, uh, and 300 million uh, meters per second if it was going through air. Uh, if it was going through water, it would be about a third slower, close to about 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. If it was going through something even thicker, like diamond, um, then it would be even slower. Less than half of this 3 times 10 to the 8th would be the speed of um, electromagnetic radiation through something like diamond. Technically, the measure of that is something called the index of refraction, that the higher the value of the index of refraction, the slower light goes through it, and the lower value, then the faster light goes through it. Um, but the fastest it can ever go is through empty space, that 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is called the speed of light, uh, even though it's technically only the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, now, we can relate these three things we talked about, frequency, speed, and wavelength, through a formula. And so the formula we can use that lets us convert between speed, frequency, and wavelength is that V equals F times lambda. The speed of a wave equals its frequency times its wavelength. This is true for electromagnetic radiation, and it's true for every other type of wave. So um, we said that the speed depends on the substance it travels, the electromagn electromagnetic wave travels through. And so this V right here, for the most part, as long as the wave doesn't switch substances, if it starts off in water, it stays in water. If it starts off in empty space or a vacuum, it stays in the vacuum. V doesn't change. But the frequency and the wavelength can. And so uh, because of the fact that frequency times wavelength have to multiply together to be the velocity, to be the speed, it means that if you do something that results in the frequency of a wave going up, to balance that out, the wavelength has to go down, and vice versa. So then, if you have a situation where the wavelength of a wave goes up, it's more distance between the troughs or the peaks than the frequency, how many waves per second, has to go down. And if you looked at a picture we did originally, you sort of saw a little bit of this. The one with the longest wavelength had the lowest frequency. So a bigger wavelength meant a lower frequency. The one with the smallest wavelength had the biggest frequency right there. And that's the reason why, because the rule is that speed equals frequency times wavelength. So you just find what the speed of the wave is, then you, that's going to equal to the frequency of the wave times the wavelength of that wave. And once again, unit-wise, we want our speed to be in meters per second. We want our frequency to be in hertz, which is waves per second. And we want our wavelength to be in meters uh, in order to use this equation. Um, won't turn out very well if you don't have in those units. Technically, it'll still be dimensionally fine, but uh, we really won't get the units that we want to get out of it. Now, the reason why that it's important to know about the frequencies and wavelength is the frequency or wavelength of an electromagnetic wave determines the type of electromagnetic radiation. Whether or not it's a gamma ray or an X-ray or a visible light or microwaves or radio, that's determined by the frequency or the wavelength because the fact that each frequency for a particular speed has a given wavelength. Um, the highest frequency waves, that is, those are the smallest wavelengths of electromagnetic rays, are gamma rays. Okay? And so you can sort of see this illustration here. It has wavelength on this side. It has frequency on this side. It has the values. You can see that the waves that are right up in here are very, very close together. That means they have a very small wavelength. And so if it has a small wavelength, it would have a very high frequency. So high freq highest frequency of electromagnetic rays or electromagnetic waves are gamma rays. On the other side, you can see way down here, these waves are very, very far apart, very large wavelength. And that means they have a very small frequency. And so those waves are radio waves. And so then in between those, you can sort of see the process. So moving up the scale, as far as electromagnetic radiation goes, from a low frequency to a high frequency, we have radio, then microwave, then infrared, doesn't say it there, but that's it, then visible light, all our colors, and those are in the order of the rainbow that you can see here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then after that, go even higher frequency, we get ultraviolet, then higher frequency than that are x-rays, then highest frequency we set are gamma rays. Um, and so as we sort of saw, for visible light that we can see, each color corresponds to a specific frequency. So if you talk about green light, is the different shades of green light each have different frequencies to them. And so we can always express uh, that type of color, so those pure colors like that, in terms of the frequency of the light that's coming in. Um, red light has the lowest frequency. Uh, and you can sort of see it down at the bottom here. Lowest frequency, longest wavelength. Violet light. Uh, purple light is going to have the highest frequency and therefore has the smallest wavelength for your different types of light. So um, moving on here, 
In the late 1800s, uh, there were a number of experiments done uh, that caused some problems with the, the thought that electromagnetic radiation is a wave. Um, basically, there were a few experiments that were done where electromagnet electromagnetic radiation didn't always act like a wave. Uh, it certainly did in some circumstances, but in these particular experiments, it really didn't act very wave-like. Uh, so there was a German scientist named Max Planck. Uh, who theorized two things about electromagnetic radiation to try to explain these discrepancies. Uh, so the first one was that electromagnetic radiation was not emitted as a continuous wave. So it's not like a wave that sort of travels just continually on and on and on like that. But instead, it was in separate individual packets that he called quanta, Q-U-A-N-T-A. -A. That's the plural. The singular is quantum. U-A-N-T-U-M, that's one packet. Quanta would be multiple packets here. And so he said, hey, the electromagnetic radiation is coming out in these individual separate packets that he called quanta. And he said, secondly, that ener the energy of each quantum of electromagnetic radiation depended on the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. And that's a big difference because for every other type of wave, the energy of that wave doesn't depend on frequency. Frequency really doesn't make a difference in terms of the energy, but amplitude does. That's how big the wave is. So for sound waves, that would be basically how loud the sound is. For water waves, it would be how high the wave goes. But according to Planck, for electromagnetic radiation, the only thing that matters for the energy is the frequency. How bright the light is, which is amplitude, makes no difference whatsoever. That's an intensity thing. And so here's the formula he came up with to find energy. He said that the energy of electromagnetic radiation, E, equals the frequency, F, times some number. And so this number right here, we called H, it's actually equal to 6.26 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. It's just about the smallest number you'll ever see in science, because uh, it's 10 to the negative 34. So you know we got to go a decimal place and then like 34, 33 zeros before we get to that first six that's right there. Tiny, tiny number. Basically this number, which later on they called Planck's constant, uh, is um, sort of the, the, the base unit of this quantum. Um, it's, it's the smallest piece of energy that uh, electromagnetic radiation could actually have. Is, so he said that these packets right here, these discrete packets, these individual packets that he called quanta, are sort of the smallest unit. So one quantum is the smallest amount of something that you can have. Um, and so that's what the word quantum means. And so in this case, he's saying, hey, this electromag electromagnetic radiation is really made of these little individual packets that he called quanta. Uh, and the energy of each quantum of this depends on the frequency by the equation we have here. Just FYI, unit-wise, uh, here's how this sort of want to, here how we want to work this here. Energy we're going to measure in joules, J-O-U-L-E-S. You can see it's spelled right here. Uh, that's our unit of energy. Uh, H is, we said, Planck's constant, the 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th. That's what we put in for H always. And then the frequency is, uh, well, the frequency. It's going to be measured in hertz, just like the other, all the other hertz is the, the frequencies that we've seen so far here. So this is sort of what Planck thought. And so according to Planck's model, you know, we said that energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. That means that if the frequency goes up, then the energy also has to come up because H is a constant. It doesn't ever change. And so the more frequency electromagnetic radiation has, the greater the frequency is, the greater the energy. And so we said, hey, greatest energy is up here uh, because of the fact that it has the highest frequency. So we have gamma rays have really high frequencies and so would have a really high energy. On the other hand, radio waves, uh, because of the fact that they have the lowest frequencies, the longest wavelengths, would have the least amount of energy. And furthermore, if we were to look at the different colors of light, we'd say that red light would be the lowest energy light, but violet light would have be the highest energy light as far as our colors. And so if you were said, hey, which has more energy, green light or yellow light? Well, you'd look at the frequencies. You'd say, well, green light is farther up the frequency chart. Green light has a higher frequency than yellow light, and so green light has a higher energy than yellow light does. And so this is a consequence of sort of what Planck found. So let's see if he's right. We need a little more evidence. And so for this evidence here, uh, we have what's called the photoelectric effect. And so basically the photoelectric effect works a little bit like this. If you have a piece of certain types of metal, um, sodium for example, uh, copper also does this, but sodium is probably one of the more important ones here, and you were to shine light on that sodium, sometimes 
it'll cause electrons to be um, kicked off. Basically, they sort of get knocked off here. It causes a little bit of electric current, and those electrons fly off of the, um, off of the piece of metal. This is basically the principle that's used in uh, solar cells. You know, you shine sunlight onto them, they produce electricity. Um, so that's called the photoelectric effect. Photo is light, electric meaning electrons, because in the, the photo, the light comes in, the electrons come off. And so that's the idea behind it. So uh, whenever they did this, they observed three important pieces of, three important things. The first one is that no electrons were ever emitted unless the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation was above a certain value, okay? No matter how intense or how bright the electromagnetic radiation. So if we were to do a sketch of this, we'll still like to do a drawing really quickly just to give you an idea on what this means. So let's suppose that we have a graph and we're going to put the frequency down at the bottom and we're going to put the energy of the electrons. And so this is the electron energy, okay, as it gets kicked off here, is that for really low frequencies, okay, didn't matter how bright the light you shined on it. You never got any electrons that came off. So for sodium, if you shine red light onto sodium, then no electrons come off at all. And so you say, okay, I'll shine brighter light on the sodium. Still, no electrons come off at all. You shine brighter light, still no electrons. So then you say, okay, well, let's move from red to the next higher frequency light. So that would be, say, orange. You shine orange light on it, no electrons come off. Doesn't matter how bright you shine it. So you try yellow, no electrons. You try green, next higher frequency. Well, it turns out for green, you start seeing electrons come off, okay? There aren't a whole lot of them, or they aren't, they aren't very energetic. They're very, very slow moving, not very high energy electrons. But once you get to green light, is there start being a few electrons that come off. And then after you get past green light, you go from green to blue light. Well, with blue light, now there are electrons that go off, and they're more, they have a little more energy to them. And then as you go from blue light to indigo light, you get even more energy. And as you go from indigo light to purple light, you get more energy. And then if you start shining ultraviolet, even higher frequency, you get more energy. So what we end up finding out here is that for low frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, whenever you shine them on certain metals, is there are no electrons that come off, no matter how bright the light is that you shine on it. But once you get above a certain cutoff point, this cutoff point right here, once you have a higher frequency than that, it always emits electrons, um, and when it always emit the, emits those is that the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. That's our second piece right here, the second observation. The energy of the emitted electrons increased directly proportionally to the frequency. So a doubling of the, or the, a double of the increase in the frequency past that cutoff point. So if I go this distance versus this frequency, so I go this frequency to this frequency, this frequency to this frequency right here, is that you can sort of see it's linear. We get a doubling of the energy of those electrons. So they're proportional to each other. Um, but the brightness doesn't matter. So if you have electrons that say have, or you have light that you're shining out of this particular frequency right here, and it produces electrons with this energy right here going across there, and if you then make it twice as bright, it still produces electrons of that energy. So brightness doesn't seem to have any effect on the energy of the electrons that come off. But brightness does affect something else. That's our third observation. The number of electrons was directly proportional to the intensity or the brightness, but was not affected by the frequency. So whenever they did this is that the, you had this frequency cutoff. So if the frequency is below a certain amount down here, you got no electrons at all. If it was above that frequency, you got a number of electrons. And the more energy the electrons had was proportional to the frequency of the light. But let's say we pick, say, a particular energy right here. And I'm covering up my graph. You can't really see much of that anymore. But let's say we're going to pick that particular frequency of light. Well, it turns out if you increase the brightness of that light right there is that the energy doesn't change, but the number of electrons do change. And so if I were to double how bright the light is, then it would double the number of electrons that come off. Now, their energy doesn't change. And so that means they still have the same speed that they're coming out at, but there'd be twice as many of them. So these are our three pieces of observ or three observations from the photoelectric effect. And this tells us a little bit about why Planck is right. So this is Albert Einstein. And so Albert Einstein came along and he said, hey, I can explain some of this. Uh, my reasoning is that Planck's light quanta, he's these little packets of energy the light have, uh, is because of the fact that light 
is not just only a wave, it's also a particle. And so the particle that Einstein called it, he named it a photon. So like it's a, the O-N usually means a particle, and then photo is light. So it's like particle of light is what it means here. And so he said that each photon contains an energy equal to the frequency times Planck's constant. That's basically Planck's equation right here, that the frequency times Planck's constant is equal to the energy. Well, this would explain some things. Well, why was it that the electrons never came off if the frequency was too low? Well, if the frequency was too small, then the energy was too low. It simply, the electromagnetic radiation simply didn't have enough energy to knock an electron off. And then, why was it that the, uh, the higher the frequency, then the more energy they had once you got past that cutoff point? Well, the higher the frequency, then the more energy. And they're directly proportional because F and E are just multiplied by this constant. They have a constant times F is equal to E. And so if I double F, I double E. And so they're proportional, just like they found on here. And then why is it for the third thing? Why would it be that the brighter the light, the more intense the electromagnetic radiation, the more of them, the more electrons came off? Well, Einstein's argument is, well, these are photons. And I got some pictures, some just a little illustration here. These aren't really what they look like, but, um, but just an illustration. You can see we've got uh, a bunch of different photons here. So uh, here I've circled four different photons. Einstein said, well, each photon that hits the sodium metal, hits the metal, is going to knock off a single electron. And so if four photons hit, it knocks off four electrons. And so if I had twice as bright a light, I wouldn't be shooting four photons. I'd be shooting eight photons. And if you had eight photons hit, it would knock off eight electrons. So brighter light means more photons, more photons mean there are more electrons that are knocked off. So it would be consistent with this idea of light being a particle. But we've already seen before that light's also a wave. So this was something that caused uh, scientists a little bit of concern at the time, and they had to come up with basically an entirely new branch of science to try to explain this. And so, because sometimes electromag electromagnetic radiation acts like a wave, and sometimes it acts like a particle. And this is called wave-particle duality. And so certain things are both waves and particles at the same time. They have a duality, a dual identity in some sense, that under certain circumstances, it makes most sense to think of electromagnetic radiation as a wave. In other, other circumstances, it, has, it makes most sense to think of it as a particle. Ne neither one is more correct than the other one. Um, they're, it's both at the same time. And so this is the foundation of the branch of science called quantum mechanics. You can see that word quantum based on Planck's idea of the smallest packet that you could have of something. And this particular science is going to allow us to explain how the electronic structure of atoms work.